I want to try something unique for today's prophecy update. Um, it's kind of a unique approach having to do with Bible prophecy as it relates to the Christian and the church. I'm doing this because the Lord ministered to me this last week concerning the letters that Jesus had the Apostle John write to the churches there in the book of Revelation. It's in chapters 2 and 3. There are seven literal churches. I'm not going to take the time today. Maybe this is another topic for another time. But there were seven literal churches close in proximity on a postal route that Jesus himself dictated to John on the island of Patmos in the year about 95 AD. And these letters were sent to these churches. It's in modern day Turkey today, by the way. You can go visit the ruins of these cities where these literal churches were. Here's what I'm hoping to accomplish in taking this unique approach. And I'm including myself. I always try to, I hope you know that, but I'm hoping that by doing this, we will examine ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts concerning these things. I want to start with the letter to the church in Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia. No, this is not the church in Pennsylvania. Uh, Philadelphia is actually a Greek word that comes from the uh, Greek word love. In the Greek language, a much bigger language than English. They have four words for love. We only have one. The four words are philia, agape, eros, and storge. Agape is that unconditional love. Uh, eros is where we get our English word erotic. It's a sexual, sensual love. Philia is a brotherly love. That's why Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And storge is the love that a parent has for a child. It's natural affection or the love that a child has for a parent. So in the Greek, they had a different, uh, different words for different kinds of love. So this was the church of Philadelphia. This was a loving church. And I want to just read... Two verses out of this letter. By the way, all seven letters end the same way. Very interestingly. Let him who hath an ear. I have two. <laughs> so do you. Let him who hath an ear hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what did the Spirit of God say to this church there in Philadelphia? Well, the Lord commends them and says, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of tribulation which shall come upon the whole world, that's the seven-year tribulation, to test those who dwell on the earth. And listen to what he says, verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. That's another interesting word in the Greek. Tacos, where we get tachometer. It's a measurement of time, revolutions per minute. In other words, Jesus said, I'm coming at a time when things are revving up. I am coming quickly. Hold fast, hold on to what you have. And then very interesting, he says, that no one may take your crown. I want to talk about that in a moment. Now, let's go to the seventh church. That was the sixth of the seven churches. This is the seventh and last church in Reve uh, Revelation chapter 3. And I want to read verses 15 through 20. It's the church of the Laodiceans. And this is, again, interesting. The name is the nature. Laodicea is the combination of two words. Laity and diocese. The laity decide. The laity rule. And that's why, of all the seven letters, it's the only one that John is told to write to the church of the Laodiceans. That's not even my church anymore. I'm not even in that church anymore. That's why I'm on the outside knocking to get into that church. 
All the other churches, the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, all of those churches, it's to the angel of the church in, in Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, to the angel of the church. And when he gets to Laodicea, he says, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. The laity have completely taken over this church. Now, what does he say? He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Okay. The reason I wanted to start with these two letters is because they speak to two kinds of Christians and two kinds of churches today. You'll forgive me for my categorizing, but I'm of the belief that all of us, again, myself included, are either a Philadelphia Christian or a Laodicea Christian. And that's what I want to talk about today, if you'll indulge me. I don't know if you notice this or not, but what's really striking in these two letters is the stark contrast between these two churches. On the one hand, you have the Laodiceans who it seems were very prosperous, very rich by the world standards. And on the other side, you had the Philadelphia church who it seems had little strength. In fact, Jesus says, I know you have little strength. And they're persevering. They're hanging on. And the Lord commends them for that. I mean, they're, they're almost the polar opposite. I would imagine if you were to go to the Church of Philadelphia in that day, it would have been probably a pretty small church. Church where the pastor preached the word. And then conversely, if you were to go to the Laodicean church, oh, hope you can find parking. This place is going and growing and jamming and happening and wow. Jesus encourages the Philadelphia church. He, he tells them, he doesn't say this to Laodicea. He says, hang on, I'm coming soon. Don't, don't be weary. Just hold fast. I'm coming quickly. And then he says, hang on to your crown so that nobody takes it from you. What crown is Jesus referring to? And, and how is it possible that somebody could take it away? Well, I think the answer to both questions is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, listen, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will, 
give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. What? <laughs> I'm going to get one of those crowns too? Now, when you start talking about crowns, guys get weird. It's kind of like, well, that's, that's for the girls. <laughs> Trust me, guys, you want one of these crowns, okay? You want one of these crowns. The crown of righteousness in store for those who long for his appearing. Better said, watch for, would love for the Lord's return. I would submit that this is the crown that awaits those like in Philadelphia, who long for, are watching for the Lord's return. Yeah, but how can somebody take that away? Oh, the Laodicean Christians can take it away. What do you mean? H how so? Oh, because... They're not longing for his appearing. Things are happening. That's the last thing on their mind. They're not looking for the Lord's return. They're not anxiously longing for the Lord to come back. You talk to some Christians today about the rapture, you would think you were talking a foreign language. And the ones who do know about the rapture, they're like, it's almost like they don't want it to happen. They're not excited about it. I, I've never been able to understand that. The only thing that I can even come close to understanding that is that they have their roots down too deep in the soil of this world. Things are too good down here. And that's the Laodicean church, isn't it? Isn't it true that when things aren't going so well, we want the Lord to come back? And when things are going really well, we're like, you know, no hurry, no worry. I'm just going to glide and abide. Right? Instead of watching for the Lord, the Laodicean Christian is watching the stock market. Stock market is great again, quote unquote. It's reaching historic and record highs. They're becoming rich. Nothing wrong. I have a stock portfolio. It's not good. <laughs> it's not doing well. But they're becoming wealthy and in need of nothing. As I was pondering this during the last week, I wondered to myself, and this is kind of how my brain works, and I know they have clinical terms for this condition, but I just kind of imagined to myself what it would be like to interview a Philadelphia Christian and a Laodicea Christian. Is that weird? That's kind of weird, isn't it? But what would their response be if you were to ask them questions about all the prophetic signs of the times in the year 2017? Actually, that's what I want to do. I want to take just two current events, both of which I would argue have prophetic significance in terms of Bible prophecy in real time, in real time. Here's the first one. It's this ongoing conflict, which isn't going away, by the way, surrounding the Temple Mount and this Israel Today article about how Israelis are marching and demanding access to the Temple Mount as well as the demanding of the building of the third temple. Oh, let me quote from the article. Monday evening marked the beginning of the Jewish fast of Tisha B'Av, which commemorates the destruction of the first and second temples. 
Thousands of Israelis participated in an annual march around the walls of Jerusalem's old city with a special focus on the Temple Mount. Though it is Judaism's holiest site, Jews are still not allowed to pray there due to threats of Muslim violence. Government officials participating in the march noted that the people of Israel are seeking much more than just the right to pray atop a Muslim-occupied Temple Mount. They want the third temple. Everyone who came here tonight proved with his feet that we want the temple and quickly, quickly, interesting word, quickly, Deputy Defense Minister Eli Ben-Dahan told Arutz 7. Okay. Indulge me, all right? Let's get the Laodicean Christian and let's get the Philadelphia Christian up here and let's ask them what they think about this news concerning the Temple Mount. Now let's start with the Philadelphia Christian. So Philadelphia Christian, what do you think? Here's the Philadelphia Christian. Oh, I know, right? I mean, quickly, the third temple? They're going to build the temple? Daniel and Revelation tell us that that's the temple that will be there during the seven-year tribulation. And if they're close to building the temple, then that means because the rapture has to happen first that we're out of here, man. I know, right? How cool is this? I'm going to hold fast, man. Jesus is coming quickly. We better get the word out. He's given us a door. He's opened a door that no man can shut. Let's reach the loss before it's too late. That's the Philadelphia Christian. Let's talk to the Laodicean Christian. So, Laodicean Christian, what do you, what do you think about the building of the temple? The what? <laughs> oh, you're not hearing about that in your church? No. The only thing we've been hearing lately at church is this knocking on our door, and it's so annoying. I wish it would just stop. And I don't know about building the temple, but you should see what we're building. Did you hear about this? They're, they're building this sophisticated aqueduct system to bring the natural hot springs from Hierapolis down to Laodicea. True story, by the way. That's why Jesus said, you're lukewarm. They knew exactly what he was talking about. You know why? Because by the time those hot springs got from Hierapolis down to Laodicea, those hot springs were not hot anymore. They were lukewarm. Who wants to take a jacuzzi in lukewarm water? So here's the Laodicean Christian. I don't know about building the temple, but we're building this. And if we could just figure out how to get that water to stay hot, it's kind of lukewarm. I don't know why. Hmm. Here's the second one. It has to do with the Wisconsin company's recent decision to embed microchips into the hands of willing employees. Do you hear about this? It's all over the news. I, 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 I was astonished. I found this article in, of all places, USA Today. USA Today, that bastion of, you know, Christian, <laughs> you know, publication. And the headline caught my eye. Mark of the Beast, microchipping employees raises apocalyptic questions. Here's just some of what the article had to say. Quote, the end times account, USA Today, the end times account in the New Testament book of Revelation warns believers about being marked on the right hand and the forehead by the Antichrist. But inserting rice-sized microchips under the skin of three square market employees does not fulfill the prophecy, said Chris Vlakos, a New Testament professor at Wheaton College in Chicago. I think that this is more of a fulfillment of end times novels and movies than it is the book of Revelation itself, Vlako said. Randall Balmer, the chair of the religion department of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, said the book of Revelation presents a real challenge 
for evangelical Christians who take the Bible seriously <laughs> and often try to interpret it literally is, okay. Well, let's ask Mr. Philadelphia and Mr. Laodicea about this, shall we? Okay, Mr. Philadelphia, what do you think about this? I know, right? I've been watching this and following the technology for years. This is so incredible. Like no other time in history, the technology exists to fulfill the prophecy in Revelation chapter 13. Man, that door's getting bigger. <laughs> Let's get the word out. Let's reach the lost. The Lord is coming quickly. Maranatha! Not so loud. You're disturbing the Laodicean Christian. We need to ask him what he thinks about this. Okay, so Mr. Laodicea, what do you, what do you think? You know, um, I don't know about anything on the forehand or the forehead, but you know what we've got? It is so amazing. And this is a true story too, by the way. They were cutting edge with, in ophthalmology, with the eyes. That's why Jesus said, uh, buy from me the eye salve so you can see, because you're blind. They had cutting edge technology for the eyes. And I could just imagine the Laodicean Christian going, man, we got some of the latest and greatest stuff. We got some stuff that you can put on the eyes that takes the wrinkles away. <laughs> forehand, forehead, no, eyes. We have it on the eyes. Wow. You just don't see it, do you? No, we see. No, you don't. You're blind. Oh, here's another thing, too. Uh, you're naked. Oh, uh, I didn't tell you. Laodicea was the fashion runway of the world at that time. They had the latest in fashion. This was a very prosperous place. That's why Jesus says, you're naked. You think you're so hip with the latest fashions? You're naked. You need me to clothe you. You need to be clothed to cover up the shameful nakedness that you have. Let me, uh, you probably already know where I'm going with this, so I'll get right to the point. Isn't this the question that's before every single one of us? Again, myself included. What kind of a Christian am I? Am I a Laodicean Christian? Or am I a Philadelphia Christian? You may not even be a Christian. Well, here's the good news. If you're a Laodicean Christian or you're not a Christian, you can do something about that today. We're going to partake together of the Lord's table. And please know that if you have to leave, we understand, but we would certainly encourage you to stay with us and break bread with us. Before we do, I want to take an opportunity, as we have in recent weeks, every week, to share with you the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel simply means good news. Your sins are forgiven. You're free. Your debt has been paid. You're free. I do so by way of the ABCs of salvation. It is so simple. It is childlike simple, as it should be. The A is simply for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner, as we've talked about. This is Romans 3.10. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one, save one, Jesus the Christ, the only one. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Once you acknowledge and admit that you're a sinner, now you readily admit your need for the Savior, and that's where the B comes in. It's believe Jesus is Lord. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, if you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So you put your trust in, you believe in, in your heart, 
And then the C is for call. Call upon the name of the Lord or confess if you prefer. This again is Romans 10, 9 and 10, which also says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And Romans 10, 13 says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to just say one last thing in the context of what we just saw, specifically with the church of Laodicea. And if you're sitting here today or watching online and you've become lukewarm, you've cooled towards the things of the Lord, and the Lord is knocking on the door, not to come in and be harsh with you or yell at you. He just wants to sup with you. He just wants to break bread with you. You have to understand, as, as we're going to talk about during the communion, that in the Middle East, in my Arab culture to this day, in the Middle East, it is so intimate when you eat together and break bread one with another. This, by the way, is why Peter would not be seen in front of the Judaizers eating with the Gentiles because it's a bond and Jews would never eat with a Gentile because of the intimacy that was associated with it. There's an intimacy, there's a, there's a bond, a common union, communion. That's all the Lord wants. The Lord loves you. There's no condemnation for you. These Laodiceans were, were Christians, they were born again. This was the church. And all Jesus wanted was to come in and have fellowship with them. Have that koinonia with them. To be with them. To eat with them. Won't you open up the door and eat and break bread today at the Lord's table with him? Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, Again, we find ourselves wholly inadequate in our ability to express to you our gratitude, our thanksgiving for loving us so much that you would send your only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish in hell for all eternity which is not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we partake together of the communion table, I pray for those of us who just need that fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be baptized anew, filled afresh, that we would draw near to you and you would draw near to us. That we would sup with you and you with us. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, again, if you have to leave, we understand. Uh, if you're able to stay, we would certainly encourage you to do so. The worship team is going to lead us in song. And as they do, you can come up. There's also a table in the back. We have two in the front. The elements are prepackaged. Uh, you can get the elements, take them back to your seat, then take your seat and then wait so that we can partake together. Go ahead and come on up. Yeah.
One of the reasons that Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, which is the account of what we affectionately refer to as the Last Supper, is my favorite, is because in it, two times, Jesus refers to his eagerly awaiting for its final fulfillment in his kingdom. Do you know that Jesus is waiting, too, for his coming? He's waiting, too. He's not just waiting, he's eagerly waiting. Just as we are eagerly waiting. As a bridegroom for his bride. I remember when my wife and I, we courted for, for two years. And when I, I proposed to her in a helicopter, I'm not gonna share that story again, only to find out she's terrified of heights, but so she would have said anything to me just to get out of that helicopter. But, so uh, I proposed to her and we, we set the wedding date and I couldn't wait. I was marking the days off on my, so was she too, but I was marking the days off on my calendar until that day when we would be married and become one. I want you to view the communion table today through that lens. Through the lens of a bridegroom who eagerly awaits for that great and final day, that marriage feast of the Lamb, where we will be partaking together with him. By the way, it's not going to be these little plastic cups with the small wafer. Listen, you have no idea. I cannot wait. By the way, guys, food in heaven, man. Food in heaven, I'm telling you. Uh, can't wait for that. But anyway, I digress. But we are going to be seated with him, his bride by his side when what we're about to do today is ultimately fulfilled in his kingdom. Luke writes, verse 14, when the hour had come, he, speaking of Jesus, sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them with, and here it is, fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's the second time. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you take the packaging and peel back the top part, you'll find the bread. Just take it out and hold on to it for a moment. We hold in our hands a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. His body broken for us in our stead. Not his bones. There was a prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. And surely in the Exodus, the Passover lamb, that they would slay the bones of that 
that lamb were never broken. It would ruin the typology. His bones were never broken. His skin was broken. His body was broken. His back whipped. His head broken from the thorns that were shoved into his skull. The wrists from those spikes. Don't use nails. Some believe they were nine inches long, which reminds me, interestingly, there's a satanic group called Nine Inch Nails. Where do you think they got that? These were nine-inch Roman spikes that were driven into the wrists of the Savior. I'm being graphic because sin is graphic. Sin is bloody. Sin is death. They took those same nine-inch spikes and they drove them into the Savior's feet as they penetrated the wood of that cross. And interesting, if you're into the typology and the significance of numbers in the Bible, but the other place that Jesus bled, the seventh place, the number of completion, because the work of the cross was finished and completed, was when that Roman soldier took his spear and penetrated the side of the Savior. And we're told that blood and water poured out from his side. Interesting, the two elements present at birth, just as the first Adam, a bride, was taken from his side, so too the second and final Adam, the church was birthed a bride from his side because it is finished. The price had been paid but he bled from seven places. His back, one, wrists, two and three, feet, four and five, his head, six, and his side, seven. His body broken for us instead of us. That's what we're celebrating today. Would you partake with me? Lord, thank you. Lord, once again, we want to thank you for giving us this to do in remembrance of you and what you did for us, your body broken for us. Just the horror of it all, what you endured despising the shame of it all, all for us. Also, you could be one with us. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your body broken for us. Luke goes on to write, likewise, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. If you take the remainder of the packaging and peel it back, you'll find the cup. And again, just hold on to it for a moment. We hold in our hands a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed in our stead. He had to shed shed his blood because the Bible says there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And so just as with the Passover lamb, they would slay that lamb and take that blood from that innocent lamb after inspecting it for four days, which, by the way, was the exact amount of time that Jesus was on trial, found to be without sin, without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. And they would take the blood, they would put it, they would dip a hyssop branch into it, and they would put it on the doorposts of their house in the shape of a cross, interestingly, so that the angel of death would pass over in that tenth plague. Absent the blood in the shape of a cross from that innocent lamb on their house, their firstborn son would die. Interesting, their firstborn son. The only begotten Son of God died 
instead with his blood fulfilling the Passover prophecy about the Passover lamb. And that's what we're celebrating here today. Would you partake with me? After you do, please stand. Lord, thank you for coming in and supping with us and us with you. Lord, thank you for the communion table that enables us to to do this. Again, Lord, I would just pray for anyone here today or watching online many of whom I know partake with us from wherever they're at, and we rejoice in that. But Lord, I just pray for anyone that has been running from you, has wandered away from you, has gotten away from you, that today they would come back. Lord, thank you that you're the God of new beginnings. That you're a God of grace. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. And if we don't see you here on Thursday night for our midweek Bible study, we'll see you, Lord willing, next Sunday.